So 5G and mech, or mobile edge computing. I've been hearing a lot about this, I've talked about it, but what I'm curious about is does it actually work? Like, does it even matter? Does it actually make a difference to us? I'm sure you've heard it, right? Like you hear 5G and mech and how it's gonna change the game for us, but I gotta be honest, it's hard for me to see that. I'm more of a hands-on person. I have to actually test it out. So that's what we're doing in this video. I grabbed a 5G phone, I grabbed my wife, and we went and found the closest 5G ultra wideband radio antenna thing in Dallas. We're putting 5G and mech to the test. Does it actually matter? Does it work? Let's see what happens. But what, hold on, real quick. You may not know what mech is. What is mech? I mean, you've probably heard about 5G, maybe from me on this video, wherever it is. It's bigger, better, faster, but mech. Let's talk about that. And thank you to Verizon for sponsoring this video. Okay, to understand mech, we're going to cover two things. First, we'll briefly cover how we access stuff on the internet. And then we'll talk about what role the cloud plays in that scenario. And of course, what it means to mech. And what the junk is mech. So here we go, super fast, super simple way of how the internet works. I need some coffee for this. Here we go. So this, this is your phone. In case you couldn't tell by my expert artistic skills. When you pull out your phone and you try to access stuff on the internet, like this video, you're actually going out or your phone is going out and talking to a server somewhere in the internet. Your phone is telling that server, hey, I want to watch this video. Give me that video. And the server will then give you that video or give your phone that video. Now, again, that's a super simple way of how the internet works. There's a lot more going on, but it's really how it does things basically. But what I want to focus on here is that this server, this sucker could be anywhere. Literally, it could be anywhere in the world which actually brings up a pretty big problem we have with the internet. You see, the server, it could be, I don't know, in my house. Network Chuck's house. It legit could be, I've got a lot of servers here. Now, I live in Dallas, Texas, and that's where my server would be. And guess what? If you live in Dallas, Texas, when you access that video, it's gonna be wicked fast. Why? Well, because you're close to me, physically close. But if you lived in like, I don't know, New York City, that's a different story. Because now when your phone asks that server for a video, it has to go freaking far to get to my server. And guess what? When that server sends the video back to you, it also has to go stinking far to get it back because you are geographically, physically far apart. And if you thought that didn't matter for the internet, it totally does. So just like it would take you forever to drive from Dallas, Texas to New York City, it takes your internet traffic a while to get there too. Much longer than it would be if the server was right there in Dallas right next to you. Now this right here, the time it takes for your internet traffic to get there and back, it's called latency. And it is the biggest factor when it comes to internet speed or performance, however you want to call it. If your latency sucks, your internet sucks. Now here's where the cloud comes in to save the day. Not even kidding, it really did. Let me show you. And this is why the cloud runs most of the internet nowadays. Now what is the cloud? Really? Honestly, it's just someone else's computer or someone else's server. And for our example, this server belongs to Amazon. Amazon Web Services or AWS. And they don't just have servers in one location, they have them all over the place. I'm not kidding. Now this is bothering me. New York's down here at the bottom, so I'm gonna move it to the top, <laughs> just cause I'm getting so confused. So track with me here. I'm moving Dallas back down to the bottom and New York to the top. So let's say you send me a message and you complain about how slow it is to get my videos to you. I hear you. So here's what I'll do. Let me remove some of that latency, let me remove some of that distance. And that's what I do. So I say, hey, so instead of putting my stuff on my own server, what I'll do is maybe say, hey, Amazon, can I put my stuff on your server? I'm basically renting space from Amazon. So I move my stuff over here and bam, I'm suddenly just closer to you, which if you guessed it, does solve some of that latency problem, doesn't it? So now when you want to watch my video, it's just boop, right there, hop, skip and a jump, man, not even far. And then I get it right to you. So quick, so fast. Now, a lot of the internet does this. Actually, most of the internet does this. You're probably accessing something on AWS servers right now. So problem solved, right? Kind of, you see, even though we're closer here, there's still distance, there's still latency. That's why even now with the cloud and things being closer to us, we still have bad performing websites, bad experiences because the internet be crazy. And <laughs> a lot of stuff can happen between New York City and Virginia. As you think about the internet, the internet was designed as a best effort service. Another way to put that is you get what you get and you don't get upset because that's how it's designed. So if you're looking to create a reliable performant user experience, you can rely on the internet, but you have no guarantees for what that performance might look like. So again, how do we solve latency? Well, we move stuff closer to you, right? We remove the distance. And that's what we did with the next thing. We uh, have things called CDNs, another new concept here, which stands for Content Delivery Network, delivering content to you, right to your door 
I just typed in you or wrote you as I was saying that. You ever do that? Anyways, content delivery network. CDNs are cool because they bring stuff really close to you. Like I'm talking, there might be a server in New York City. And that video you're trying to watch on my server, that sucker might be cached or actually live on a server in New York. So when you say, yo, network Chuck, let me see that video. I'm like, hey, it's right there. There you go. <laughs> right there in your pocket in your next door. And CDNs are awesome because you can distribute your stuff everywhere. So that's it, right? Problem solved. No, not quite yet, because we still haven't talked about mech, and mech solves some problem, right? It does. You see, CDNs can only cache or store certain types of internet stuff. And when I, when I say stuff, I mean like pictures and, and videos, basically static content. But that's not all we're doing on the internet now. The internet's getting kind of crazy. We're doing stuff like artificial intelligence, which is actually what I'm about to test, so you're gonna see that here in a second. But let's say instead of a simple website that's just trying to give you a video, Let's say you're trying to use an AI application that will identify an object in a photo. Take a picture and it identifies it. Hey, hot dog, hey, regular dog, baby, beard, car, whatever. So let's play out that example real quick. You got your phone, take a picture of a hot dog or a real dog, doesn't matter. I'm gonna try and draw a hot dog. <laughs> That's the worst hot dog ever, but it's a hot dog, man. Your phone will then send that picture to my app, my AI app. So it has to go all the way to Virginia. Here the AI will process it, go, oh, what is that? Oh, it's a hot dog. So then it sends it back to my phone. Bro, it's a hot dog. And now, dadgummit, we're back to square one because we still have this latency. The CDN can't help us because the CDN can only cache, again, videos and, and static media like pictures. It can't cache the artificial intelligence, the compute that lives on my server, which is what I have to communicate with to be able to use this app. As an example, maybe I'm, I have an in-venue mobile application experience in the Miami area. It's very likely that that mobile application logic is nowhere near Miami. It could very well be that the web page itself is cached using something called a CDN or content delivery network in Miami, but the dynamic compute logic can't live in the CDN. That's not how CDNs are designed today. Your application logic is probably in Northern Virginia. And I actually just made the drive from Miami to Northern Virginia. Let me tell you, it's not close. It's about <laughs> a thousand miles, but in network time, that also adds up. We call that round trip time delay. And that round trip time delay is the difference between a real time experience and a slower, maybe laggy, less performant experience that no longer really feels that you're effectively transacting with that physical world using that digital experience or mobile application. You can't cash this, can't cash me outside. How about that? <laughs> Sorry for that. It was in my head and I had to say it. You're welcome. Now, latency is a huge factor in a situation like this with artificial intelligence. Now, it may, may not be as simple as a silly little app that identifies a hot dog. It might be like an autonomous car that's identifying people as you're driving, and you might want something pretty dang quick to identify a person and not a piece of trash pretty stinking quick. I definitely want low latency on my Tesla. So now, what do we do? Well, you probably saw this coming. We're now finally going to talk about mech or mobile edge computing. Gonna erase the CDN. He just can't cut it, man. Can't play here. Now, there's this big buzzword, mech, M-E-C. What is that? That's a great question. I mean, the way that I think about mobile edge computing, it's all about extending the cloud computing environment today in which you're already building applications and moving that to the edge of the network to deliver a lower latency experience. So today, very often, you're probably already building your mobile application in the cloud that when I'm connecting to that social media application or AR, VR experience, or maybe an, a stadium in venue application uh, to sort of connect with the physical world, I'm probably already connecting to a cloud computing endpoint, but I'm also probably connected to a cloud computing endpoint that is nowhere near me from a geographic perspective. Now, here's what can happen with Mech. Let's say the part of the app that we absolutely need quick access to the AI, the artificial intelligence. Let's say we move that closer to you. Again, removing latency, solving our problems. Let's put it right up next to you. That is what we're doing with mobile edge computing. We're taking the compute, the part of the app that you need super fast access to, and we move it closer to you, to the edge of the network, which is where we are, where you are. So when you do take a picture of that hot dog, I'm gonna try to draw a hot dog again. Here we go, bear with me. Can I do it better this time? Let me know if below if that's better or worse. I need to label it hot dog. I can't even read my writing though. <laughs> Who cares? It's a hot dog. When you take a picture of that hot dog and you send it to the app, bam, 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 it's right there. 
There I'm back. Upload the photo, the AI is right there. It goes bam, hot dog, bam, it tells you the hot dog is a hot dog. Super fast. <laughs> That's what we're doing with mobile edge computing. But how? How has that compute moved closer to you? Well, I'm not sure if you saw this coming, but it involves AWS again. <laughs> AWS got you to Virginia. Now they're coming and they're inside your pocket somewhere. AWS partnering with Verizon put some of their servers super close to you. These are called wavelength zones and man, they're right in your backyard. People who make wicked awesome AI apps that can identify hot dogs can put the part of their app that's super latency sensitive, like the AI that tells you if it's a hot dog, they can put that, bam, right inside a wavelength zone that's close to you. And of course, when you combine that with 5G, which again is bigger, better, faster, you can do things pretty stinking fast because you can upload your photo of your hot dog wicked fast to the server that's right there in your backyard. It processes the AI, says, oh, hot dog, and sends it back to you super fast. That's mech, that's mobile edge computing, putting the compute at the edge close to you so things are faster. Now, two things with that. First, does it actually work? Like, does this actually matter? I, I'm tired of all the marketing speak. Let's get, let's get beyond that, okay? Let's actually test it. So that's what we're doing right now. So again, back to my story of taking my 5G phone <laughs> and my wife to Dallas, we identify a ultra wideband antenna to actually test this with, and we start testing. And then my second thing, cool, AI, taking a picture of a hot dog and telling me it's a hot dog. I don't need to know that. I can see with my eyes it's a stinking hot dog. So my second thing is that, what's the real world application here? How will this actually be used, 5G and mech? Cool, the server's closer to you. Cool, latency is lower. But what needs that? Turns out, quite a few things. And I actually got a chance to talk with a really, really amazing company that is using this and it's amazing. And I'm kind of excited, actually really excited to see what the future is going to hold. So wait for that or you can jump to the timestamp where this lives and watch it right now. But anyways, let's test some 5G and mech. Does this actually work? Okay, here we go. Time for the Verizon 5G mech test. Does mech matter? So here's the premise. I take my wife, my baby, my Tesla, and a 5G phone to downtown Dallas to test out mech. Now, why downtown Dallas? Well, that's where they have these ultra wideband antennas, these radios. So you can get these crazy fast 5G speeds. And thankfully we found one in my most favorite area of Dallas, Deep Ellum. It's actually where I used to host my uh, servers in my data center. But anyways, I locked onto a good signal. I had my coffee, my baby, and time to perform the test. Now again, what I'm testing is an artificial intelligence app. Essentially, I take a picture of something and it tells me what it is, it identifies it. And for each photo I take, I'm gonna do two tests. One with traditional cloud infrastructure, meaning that I have to go all the way to stinking Virginia, where AWS's servers are, one of the closest data centers, to get my information. Then the second test will be using mech. Mobile edge computing right there in my backyard, my back pocket, close to me. And what we're looking for here is, is it faster? <laughs> Does it actually make a difference? So let's try it out. First, let's try a car. So I'll snap a picture of this car. I try the first server. Not too bad, 2.019 seconds, eh, it's good. Now let's try the mech server. Boom, 1.314 seconds, that's faster. <laughs> now in human speed, that's like, who cares Chuck, but in computer speed, where things like this actually matter, that's huge. Anyways, let's keep testing. So let's try to figure out things to take pictures of and actually test this app and uh, you know, hey, why not my baby? So let's try my baby. So cool, my baby is a person. We got 1.998 seconds when going all the way to Virginia. Now, with mech, what do we got? Woo, 1.251 seconds. Okay, it seems to be working. Then I tried to take a picture of my wife, <laughs> who was actually manning the camera that day. But instead of identifying her, and identified a parking meter right behind her, and it did that in 2.014 seconds. But instead of going to Virginia, let's go to mech right here in my backyard. Woo, 1.128 seconds. Okay, things are, things are humming, let's see. And then since we were in Dallas and Deep Ellum, my wife, she loves Instagram, so I'd take a picture of her for Instagram, and I went ahead and used that same photo for <laughs> my mech test. Virginia told me she was a person in 2.180 seconds, but mech told me 1.262. I then tried my Tesla, but for some reason ignored my Tesla and looked at the car behind me. Maybe because the Tesla is so good, it came and recognized how cool it is. I don't know. 2.082 seconds in Virginia, 1.156 seconds. And then finally, I wanted to see if it would recognize my beard, so I tried that, and all it did was notice my nostrils for some reason, and it said, yes, I'm a person, good to know. 2.102 seconds in Virginia, and dang, 1.291 seconds with mech. 
So what this test does demonstrate is that, yeah, mech definitely makes a difference. And sure, at the end of the day, we're talking milliseconds, which to, you know, humans and how we perceive time, it's like, that's not that big of a deal. But for computers who are processing crazy amounts of data, computational data, artificial intelligence, things that require real-time interaction, we're talking augmented reality, people, and AI, that's a huge thing. So that was our test. Let me know what you think in the comments below. But now let's talk more about real world. I got a chance to interview Sebastian, the co-founder and CTO of YBVR. This company is using 5G and Mac to provide immersive 360 video experiences for live events. I'm talking sports and concerts, and they try to make it to where you're, I don't know, actually there without being there. Which as we talk in the interview, you'll find out is pretty dang impossible without using technologies like 5G and Mac. Now the technology they use to do this is just crazy and mind boggling, but essentially they have these insane 360 cameras. I'm running out of adjectives here. They have these 360 cameras that will capture just everything and they'll send this data back to a server for processing. Now, traditionally, as you can imagine, this server would be kind of far away, giving us that crazy headache of latency like we've talked about this entire video. And the last place you want latency is in like a live event. Like, oh my gosh, is he gonna score that goal? I don't know. <laughs> it blipped. So this is where Mac comes in, mobile edge computing, and this is where our interview begins. I start by asking Sebastian how their crazy 360 camera contraption works, how it sends the data back and forth, where it needs to send data, and where 5G and Mac will come in to kind of save the day. So let's jump in. Now, the compute that you're doing, so like traditionally, right, you have your fiber connected to your crazy contraption. Um, you get your compute in like AWS, but traditionally that's going to be pretty far away from where your camera is going to be. Um, what what is actually being computed in AWS? What are you doing with that footage? And and what is it? What are you doing that it sends back to the user? Yeah. So right now in the current implementation, what we have in AWS is our video streaming server. So it's a it's a, a server software that basically redirects the video and keeps track of all the user sessions. It also takes care of uh, users changing cameras. So when a user wants to change camera, this software is the one that will be, okay, you want to switch to that one, coordinates. It's kind of like a traffic police that coordinates, all coordinates all those those video streams. And this is the, the current situation. That's, that's what we have today. Now what we're working on is bringing also the video processing on the mix. So right now what we do, as I said, we have a computer next to the camera that is processing the video. And then from there it goes to the Mac. The next thing we want to do is just move that computer also to the Mac. And that will simplify, and that, that's just a matter of economy, right? That will simplify a lot our deployments. That makes it easier, cheaper, and faster to have more cameras in more events in more uh, in more stadiums, right? Okay, so that's, pr that's pretty crazy. So before you would have to um, have a separate computer from your crazy contraption that would process the video, you'd also have to send a lot of traffic to AWS, which could be really far yeah. away, send it back to the user wherever the user is. And if it's in a stadium, that's like, that's a lot of trips, congestion, the open network, like it's crazy. But with- Exactly, it's, it's the best, best effort network over the internet. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, you're, you're not guaranteed, you're gonna miss that shot. <laughs> you switch to the camera, what camera? It's gone, like, it's just gonna be crazy. But with 5G and Mac, it's, um, you're right there, AWS Wavelength, Mech right there, and uh, exactly. the compute and latency just banned. So what's the difference in latency you guys are seeing versus using uh, Mech versus traditional? So, and this is not only because of the, because of the Mech, it's, it's a different architecture. So the Mech is enabling a different architecture in our traditional uh, solution, uh, this one that's based on the centralized AWS region, uh, we have like 40 seconds latency. And then we developed this low latency, so it went from 40 seconds to, 0.7 seconds. It's of course all that difference is not just the network. It's that this new network allows a different architecture that is much more efficient in terms of latency. So thanks to this, now we we basically we're yeah we're in the sub second uh, as we call it sub second latency, which is now a new a new use case. Like with 40 seconds, you can't really do anything in a stadium. You know, like you give a phone to someone watching a game, that something that happened 40 seconds ago, it's going to be... Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's like, going, why, it's why are you showing me this? <laughs> why do I care about this? A, <laughs> a uh, separate so angle of point, something you saw 40 seconds ago doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, at that point, our, our conversations were like, yeah, maybe we can do replays, you know, maybe if it's 40 seconds, maybe 40 seconds after something, we can just replay it, uh, which is cool, but it's not, the, it's not the real deal. The real experience is if I can watch all the different cameras whenever I want, while well, I still keep an eye on the game, right? And that's what, where we are now. Yeah, that's killer. Cause like I know, you'll you'll never have like the perfect seat in a stadium because you're always gonna miss out on one angle of a view. So that that's pretty cool. So I can have the best seats in the house, but I can still have my phone up and watch the other side of the stadium and like see that ball or whatever fly over. That that's pretty cool. I, I like that experience. Um, 
So the goal is to have that where you're watching it in 2D on your phone or having some kind of augmented reality glasses or VR goggles that could see all that. So that, that's the goal there, right? Yeah, exactly. And with the same production, we really stream both ways. So we can stream low latency to the stadium and then you can watch in your phone and potentially air. I don't think we'll see people taking their VR headsets to the stadium just because socially it will be kind of weird, right? <laughs> but, but then you can do that, that at home. So if we, from the same camera, you end up having people watching that camera from their homes in VR and they feel like they're standing there in the stadium. And having people watching with their with their phones in 360, we also support Zoom in, in 360 8K because 8K is massive in a phone, in a tiny phone screen. Mm -hmm. You can really zoom in a lot and see a lot of details. In the 360, you can then zoom and read like the small text and everything. And, uh, and it's just one production, one camera for two different use cases that are the same experience but different, like the person watching from home and the one watching at the stadium. Man, that's... Now, how just honestly, how far away do you think we are from that kind of experience? Like, I know, I know, it's kind of like in beta now, but like, how far away from day to day this being the thing? So, the watching from home is it's no longer beta. We've been doing a lot of uh, a lot of events. We've been doing live events, live sports, like top tier live sports, since uh, twenty eighteen. Man, the last one, the, the last one we did recently was the the finals of the European Basketball League, the Euro League, and uh, and that was a paid event. That was like a, a people paying their tickets to watch it in VR, and it was a big success. Dang. And, um, Why aren't you guys so at the Olympics? <laughs> 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 That'd be so fun to watch in VR right now. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's here, and the low latency is the thing that is is a beta is in the lab. We're working together with Verizon to bring it to stadiums. So the low, low latency, uh, also COVID situation has kind of make it made it a bit more complicated. Uh, they're coming back to the stadiums. But now when people are coming back to the stadiums, uh, that now it's when we're, we're moving that thing. And I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll start seeing that in, in different stadiums uh, uh, around the world, probably. That's insane. Uh, I, I can't imagine that. Now, I, I saw in one of your videos this morning, you said that, uh, or not you, but the video said that yeah. viewers can stream content under any network condition. Um, how does that work? Yeah, so, so as I explained, since we don't stream the entire 360, because people need to understand that when you're watching a 360 video on YouTube, YouTube is receiving the entire 360 video. Mm -hmm. And the parts that you're not seeing, you have your browser, you're only see part of it, uh, those are still being used. Those are still being streamed all the way to your computer, to your phone, and the, they are taking network resources, right? So with our field of view optimization um, technology that we developed, we have a patent on it, we only stream that part. And on top of that, it, we do what, what's called ABR, it's adaptive bitrate. Uh, that's an interesting term. So basically the video will adjust to the conditions of your network. So it's the most efficient stream because we're, we're only sending in 8K the part you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, if your network is a little bit not so great, it will decrease the quality a little bit, but you will still see it. So it, it will basically always will give you the best quality for the direction you're looking and for the network that you have. And that's what our software is doing. It continuously keeps reevaluating. It, it measures the network conditions and it monitors the head direction in your VR headset. And for that direction, for these network conditions, it will just give you the best quality possible for that. Man, my gosh. Now, um, I was gonna, you said something earlier, I thought of the question, I forgot it now, but um, yeah, it was around stitching. So I know I've, I've tried to do 360 video myself, like record it and then try to edit it. It takes a lot of compute power to like stitch together and make it look good. So you're doing that on the fly, live. Um, previously or currently you're doing that with computers separate from the, the machine itself um, on site. But the goal is to get that into mech, right? Exactly, exactly. To be able to do the stitching also in the mech. The stitching, just for those of you who don't know, the stitching is a 360 camera is literally multiple cameras pointing in all the directions. Then there's a software that needs to take the video from each one of those cameras and like blend it, stitch it together into one big video in a way that you don't notice the, the differences that it was from both different cameras. And that's, as you say, it's very computing intensive. Right now we have big gaming PCs uh, doing the job, basically with big <laughs> NVIDIA GPUs and all that. Uh, and I confess to every now and then we play a game, a game or two on those. Why not? Yeah, in VR, and, of course. Uh, yeah. So, so, so we have them around, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that's what we're moving to the Mac. Uh, that's, so then we can do all that processing, we can do it on the Mac, and it's way more efficient, it's way cheaper. We only use the processing in the Mac uh, when we need it, because that's one of the beauties of, uh, of the cloud and the Mac, by extension, is that you only pay for what you use. Yeah. Whereas if you buy a computer, you pay for the computer. You use it or not. If it's sitting in your office and you're not using it, still you paid for it, right? So we will only pay for the computing that we're using whenever we're, we're streaming 
and it's going to be way more efficient, way, way more affordable. And that will help extend this type of experiences, right? One of the problems of this type of experience is that it's not so cheap to do a complete full VR production, right? It requires things that are still kind of experimental, especially if you want to do like 8K, 60 frames per second. Mm -hmm. So big part of our effort is we need to make this more affordable so it can reach to more people, we can cover more events, and it can be going, become more of a mainstream thing. Yes, I can't imagine like having to go to an event, have all the cameras you have, the fiber connections to those, and also setting up the, the gaming PCs there on site as well. That's a lot of work. That's a whole crew. Um, yeah, but exactly. Then throwing up in the cloud, though, that's... I mean, first of all, it's cool you can do that because the, the 5G and Mac, the latency, that requires super low latency to have it stitched together, get back to you. Um, and then you could probably just send like three or four people instead of an entire team that manages. Like, that's that's pretty crazy. Yeah, or just one. Like, oh, uh, yeah, just like, one, yeah. <laughs> that's basically our, our goal is just to send one person and maybe not even the whole uh, the whole time. You know, just like someone that couldn't drop the camera because here it's the use the user is the, the director of the event. So we don't need a director mm -hmm. that is like switching to camera one, camera three. You as a user, you can control those things. Uh, we're even planning to make it uh, um, social so people can vote, which is the right camera. And uh, you can say, take me to the most popular camera. And then you can just like automatically switch depending on the on what other people are doing. Right? You read my mind. So, like, uh, I was going to ask, like, I know when I'm watching VR, sometimes I'm like, Am I going to miss something like looking at this like soda can over here on the side and like th th yeah. something happens over here? So you're going to have like intelligence and there where people can vote to, like, oh, this is the one you want to watch. This is where stuff's happening. Or maybe you'll have AI saying, okay, hey, look over here. Like an arrow will like, give you a notification or something. Exactly. And we already have the information because we know at any given moment in time, we know where the users are, which camera they're watching. So at any point, we can say this is the most popular camera right now. So, uh, so those are the things we're working on. What I want to say is since you don't need a director, you don't need, it's not such a big production. You don't need camera operators because if you have an operator in a 360 camera, there will be a guy that you will see in the camera, right? Like by yeah. definition, you cannot have anyone operating the camera as opposed to a television camera. So, so this is uh, something that works very well with, with very, very little operation. It's like our goal is just to send one person to set up everything and just be around in case something breaks, but not really do much, right? Man. So do you see, and I, I know it's hard to kind of predict this, but do you see 360 cameras replacing much of what we're doing with modern sports broadcasting? Because um, like right now, they you get camera operators all over the place, zooming in, you got cameras flying in from strings, you know, coming in. Do you see this replacing that? Especially because you can put the cameras on their helmets and have that experience right there. That's crazy. Yeah, so I, I don't know about replacing, at least not anytime soon, but but some of the discussions we've had with, uh, with our customers were, uh, if we can do things the other way around. Right now, we incorporate the television, the broadcast streams into our experience. So while you're in 360, you can also see the uh, like a floating, big floating jumbotron. We call it the virtual jumbotron. And you can see there the, the, the video from the TV. And it's synchronized with what's happening in the, in the 360 video. So you can get the best of both worlds, right? Mm. And now we're talking also in the other direction, in sending from our 360 camera to the television crew. So when you watch your traditional network linear ch channel on, on TV, they, they might also show some parts of the 60 cameras at a given point. And, uh, and what they were telling us is that sometimes there are things that none of our cameras are, are catching in, in a game. I was going to say, like, yeah, that'd be camera, so hard to catch, catch everything. everything. Exactly. A 360 camera, by definition, it will catch everything around it. So if you have something that, uh, that is not part of, the, uh, of where the, all the other cameras are pointing, you can still get it, right? In one of our events, this is just a, a, like the, the, one of our events. Um, suddenly, someone started running naked around the, the field. <laughs> uh, not entirely naked. Uh, he, he did wear did wear pants, but but the the television crew didn't catch it. So afterwards, they were asking us, uh, "Can you find that guy?" Because we recorded everything. Can you find that guy? We'd like to have footage, but no, no, nobody got it. And, we went back into our, our footage and we saw it. Of course, we were covering everything. <laughs> so and there, there he was running around. He just like did very briefly, but uh, but yeah, the point is, um, it's it's interesting in both ways. And I, th I see more cross pollination. You know, more like mm. traditional television getting advantage of 360 video and 360 video also integrating traditional television into the experience, which is what we do. <sighs> That's so cool. And I, I also have the thought too that like. And, you know, when there's a flag in the play or when there's a penalty and they have to review the tapes or whatever, I, I would imagine 360 cameras can be really in hand, because like, maybe you don't have the right angle to review those tapes. That's just, you can just have them placed throughout the stadium and you can catch every single moment, every single detail. That's, that's yeah, pretty Yeah, exactly. Cool. <laughs> nothing, nothing will escape to a 360 camera, yeah. <laughs> so apart from um, 
sports, are you going to be doing any other kind of uh, 360 experiences? Yeah, so right now we're mostly focusing on sports and music. And uh, and for music, we, we do something that is very interesting with the multi-camera, which is we also support multi-audio. And our Whoa. solution is very flexible with the audio. Um, typically for sports, we have the same audio for most of the cameras, but maybe for some of them we'll have a separate audio. They have something special, like I mentioned before, the helmet cams. When we did the helmet cams, there was a camera inside the helmet of a football player. We also have the audio from the camera because then you could hear the player shouting and running. And That's everything. pretty cool. And for, for music, it's way more exciting. For music, we've done a, a, a bunch of concerts now, and that this is the next thing we're, we're discussing is we want to have uh, different mixes, audio mixes per camera to the point that you, you can have a camera next to the guitar player. And uh, and if you, you're you watching your favorite band, but you're a, a, a big fan of the guitar player, so you will go to the guitar player camera, and there you will get an audio mix that has a little bit more guitar than the other ones. You hear the guitar louder, uh, and maybe some ambient microphone, so you could hear like what's happening in that in that part of the stage. And so when the guitar player starts the solo, you can hear very clearly the solo because you have a, your special audio mix, and then you go to the drummer, and you hear more of the drums because that's where you're standing, right? So we're making that's it crazy. consistent to the, to, to the position in, in the stage. And that can give you an experience that doesn't exist, basically, right? Like it's a way of enjoying a concert that is very different from from watching it from the crowds. It's cool to watch a concert from the crowds, but you don't get that level of quality. Of I'm standing on stage next to my favorite singer, and I can hear the vocals higher than the rest of the band because they gave me a special mix that has more vocals, and I can hear him sing better. And I don't have like the drummer making so much noise. So um, I'm a musician myself, and I find that super exciting. So we're, music is like also one of the things where we're we're pushing in the direction. That's crazy. You're making people not want to leave the house. I mean, why would you go anywhere <laughs> if you can just do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's insane. So um, no big plans for anything outside of music and sports right now? Or are you guys thinking about things right now? That's mostly. So we have some other projects uh, uh, related to low latency and things like remote monitoring. Because when you start, we, we developed the low latency solution mostly for for sports, as I said, for in-stadium usage. But when you have a solution that can stream 360 video in less than one second, uh, that catches the interest of a lot of people. So we've had a lot of people coming to us with use cases that are different from from those are more like the enterprise side of, uh, of use cases, like remote monitoring. Like I have this facility I would like to monitor remotely, but I don't want to have to travel to that facility. Can I just put on a VR headset and send a 360 camera and watch it real time from there and see if something is happening? And uh, so we're starting to experiment in that direction. Our main focus is still the entertainment side of things, mm-hmm. but this is kind of like a, a side, effect, side, side project uh, uh, because of this new solution, this new low latency solution. And of course, in those more corporate enterprise type of use cases, the the five G and the Mac also make a, a big difference. Oh yeah, yeah, huge, man. I, it's it's just crazy because like you, I, you 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 make a good point. People are like, wow, you're doing three sixty video in under a second. We we can barely do that with quality, right? so. yeah. 8K, we can barely do that with just two D video. <laughs> so you're doing it with three sixty. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of nuts. That's impressive. That's pretty cool. Um, and it's cool to see that five G and Mac are kind of helping that s- streamline, help you do it better, um, help you do it in more places. I mean, because I, I imagine that not every stadium has amazing f- uh, fiber connectivity. Um, and maybe events won't be just at stadiums. Um, golf courses, like you mentioned, like I just can't imagine the logistics yeah. of a golf course. That's so dumb. But yeah. I, you never think about that. That's that's crazy, man. Yeah, it gets, it gets, it gets, it's possible. It just gets very very expensive, right? Well, I guess I do have one question, kind of origin story stuff. What what was the story behind YBVR? Why did you guys start doing this? Yeah, so um, so we're a team of uh, professionals coming from the from the video industry, from the software for video streaming, right? And um, I personally am a big fan of uh, virtual reality, of the whole idea since uh, when I was a kid in the 90s. Uh, there was like a small, shy VR wave in the 90s where the, I remember as a kid going to VR arcades. <laughs> and they had like a super clunky big headset with like lowest resolution polygonal graphics or whatever. Uh, and I got as a little kid, I found that mesmerizing, right? And as a kid, I was always uh, fascinated by technology. And I remember playing those games and they were horrible. But I could totally imagine the potential of that, you know, just like you put on a screen in front of your eyes and you're tricking your brain to believe you're somewhere else. That's amazing. The days works perfectly. It's it's amazing. And, and and VR is not a new concept because this idea is it's really obvious. A lot of people really saw it very, very early. At a point in the 90s where it was too early for that world. It was too early for 
the technology didn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and when uh, when they launched the Oculus Rift development kit some years ago now, like uh, seven years ago, I think, I, I bought it automatically. And I started playing with it, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is like what I loved in the 90s, but now it's coming. It's, it's becoming real, and it's mostly because of like all the components inside of your headset uh, are the things that exist in the smartphone. So basically, smartphones are the, what enabled this new wave of, of virtual reality. And, uh, and then I realized that video experiences were actually really cool. I always thought that VR would be for, for 3D environments, for gaming simulations, you know, like a virtual world. Mm -hmm. But... But it turns out that you just put a 360 camera somewhere, and when you put it on your headset, it looks like you're there. If it's well done, if the quality is good, if it's sharp enough, it can trick your brain. Uh, you can, for a maybe for a short time, you might end up forgetting that you are in a video, and you might think it, and you might try to, to grab something. You know, you, we see people like trying to grab something and realizing, no, you're not there for real. Let me try that. You know? So, uh, so it's it's yeah, it's like my childhood dream uh, became true, and we saw. Uh, me with my with my co-founder we saw uh, that we had the right skills for this like we were experts in video and the solutions that existed for video this was like over five years ago uh, the solutions were really primitive the video quality was still not good enough and we just started brainstorming automatically just like but we could do this and that and why don't we adjust the videos you move your head how would we do that and we started thinking about ways of solving the problem to the point that we ended up quitting our jobs and, <laughs> and since we were, we're already here in, in Silicon Valley and I guess like this whole environment of startups and people starting companies and, and companies failing and companies succeeding and all that it's kind of like a, a more motivated as you know like when you're in an environment where everyone is doing their startup it's like yeah let's 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 do it why not it's a it's a good idea and it's been quite a ride it's been uh, almost five years now and uh, and this just keeps getting better it's how big is your team now and uh Huh? We're 25 now. Wow, man, that's crazy. We're 25 and we're hiring like crazy. We're spending, I'm spending most of my time either hiring new people, interviewing people, or training new hires. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's very exciting. It's very exciting times. VR is growing a lot. In the, and uh, yeah, we see mostly Facebook is pushing very hard for that direction. And uh, I think it's something that is in the next three, four, five years is going to become mainstream. Yeah. And when that happens, we want to be the reference for, for sports and for music. Now, I know this is off topic to 5G and Mech, but my audience will kill me if I don't ask this, but um, what type of skill set do you need for a job at your company? What, what are you looking for? We have a lot of different profiles, uh, mostly software developers, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. specifically software developers with skills in video. So anyone that understand, understands video coding, video streaming, uh, but also anyone that loves 3D graphics, I'm also like a big fan of uh, of 3D graphics, video games. Uh, most of, of our employees are gamers, and we uh, our team building activities is just playing games online with them. <laughs> and uh, and people that are fascinated with, with technology, you know, people that are dreamers that dream about what technology can do in the future, not what technology does today. Uh, but which can be software developers. We also have commercial people. We have uh, product managers. We have people doing usability uh, design. Uh, but we, the thing that I would say we all share is that uh, this uh, dreaming about the possibilities uh, and about reinventing uh, a little bit the world of uh, of live streaming. Gosh, that's that's so crazy. Hey, it's so weird. Like you'll see movies that talk about this kind of stuff. That like, talks about this immersion. Like people, like uh, what was it? Um, oh goodness, this Red, Red Player One, right? Yeah, re yeah, Ready Player One. Um, that's 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 a better example than I thought of. I was thinking like Inception, where like they go into Dream World, but it's kind of like oh, that. Inception. Yeah, yeah. Like you just you can escape to almost another reality that's becoming more and more real. Um, and now you're you're creating experiences where you can escape to someone else's reality, which is even weirder, and it's becoming more and more real all the time. Um, <laughs> man, yeah. it's 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 crazy. Um, well, Sebastian, that's all I got, man. Thanks for uh, coming on and telling us about this amazing company and VR and how you're using 5G and Mech. Uh, technology we can all like kind of use right now, but you're using it in a very cool way. Um, that's crazy. <laughs> it's so exciting. Thank you. Yeah. We're having a lot of fun here.